Uh, good evening, one and all. And it's always a pleasure to call a professor. And that too from a university of an esteemed uh, value within the students and professors as well as amongst lawyers and judicial services. And we all know that the value which National University of Judicial Science, NJUS, Kolkata carries. And as they say that once you study from the National Law University, you are in a different space. And for that, you have to understand the aviation mode. And while taking these things forward, we thought, why not have a session on the topic itself, an overview of the aviation law. So we all know that it's a subject which is catching up off late and very rapidly. The speed with which normal the motor vehicles don't carry, but the aviation is in a remote. And so it's also catching up the way that uh, aviation, otherwise it's connected. And amongst us, we have a speaker, Professor Dr. Sandeepa Bhatt, a professor of law and a director of Center and Aviation and Space Law in NEJUS, Kolkata. And we has a vast experience of taking webinars, seminars, and more importantly, he's also rank holders uh, for his LLM, he's a gold medalist, and his sessions, they also say, is worth as, as worth as gold, because the way he takes those sessions are different, for a different time. And uh, for this, we had requested him for two sessions on the, on the aviation law and space law and back to back so that there is no space between the two sessions and people can connect it automatically. And he has a, a experience of research with the World Bank, ISRO, West Bengal Judicial Academy, Ministry of Justice, and Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And he has also the distinction of being a member of the International Institute of Space Law. His resume is such that we can, in fact, same amount of consumption of time as what we will be doing on the webinar itself. So, uh, we thought that we should cut the uh, resume because people know once you connect that the what quality of speaker would come. And without taking much time, I would request Mr. Bhatt to take things forward. We are actually uh, willing to take off the flight mode itself. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Let me just try to share the screen again. Screen share. Yeah. Allowed? It's allowed. Yeah. I think mean, you can see it now. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, good evening to all of you, friends. Uh, and I should thank uh, Beyond Law for giving me an invitation to speak on aviation law today. Mr. Bhatt, your video is off. I think it's happening automatically. There is some problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's so fine. you can see me now. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Anyhow. Right. So let me uh, thank uh, Beyond Law for their uh, kind invitation to deliver this uh, lecture today on aviation law and uh, tomorrow on the space law. So uh, before I start this lecture, let me also unveil a myth about air and space law. I think this is very crucial. We have aviation law, we have got space law, but I should say that we don't have air and space law. There is no air and space law, especially because of the reason that aviation law and space law are the two entirely distinct fields of law. There is no interconnection whatsoever, even though in general parallels we say air and space law, and even some of the universities prescribe the syllabus in the form of air and space law. I should say that there is no connection whatsoever between the aviation law and space law. And even when uh, Vikas contacted me and when he requested me a session on air and space law, I told the same thing that actually there is no connection. So ultimately, actually, so he planned for having two different sessions on aviation as well as the space law. I always tell my students that studying air and space law together is nothing but studying criminal law along with the tort law. It is not even actually studying tort law along with the consumer protection, which may go hand in hand. 
but i should say that it is the tort law along with the criminal law especially because the principles concepts whatever are there under the aviation law are entirely different from space law except the fact that the outer space is just next to the air space there is no interconnection whatsoever between the air law and space law and in fact if you look into the different concepts they are contradictory to each other like the system of licensing or maybe the system of registration or aspect of liability under aviation law and space law are entirely different and conflicting with each other so precisely because of that reason i always insist that aviation law and space law need to be studied separately and we should not club them together to have one single set of the law now uh, this i think probably uh, all of you would be able to understand in these uh, two day sessions today we will be understanding the aviation law what are the uh, of course i am giving just a brief overview of that so we have just one hour which is available at the disposal so that i will just be giving an overview and in tomorrow's session i'll be discussing about the, uh, the outline of the space law to start with historically aviation laws origin started in 1784 itself of course i am not telling about some international development at the municipal level for the first time in 1784 the paris police has passed a decree for the purpose of preventing the flying of balloons from germany over france especially because they were very very skeptical about the possibility of any kind of a damage which might have been caused by the balloons flying over uh, the french territory some people uh, flying above the territory and throwing something down and causing damage so in order to prevent that the paris police for the first time came up with a decree uh, which was the first decree applicable to the air space in 1784 there afterwards some developments were happening in uh, the states in the municipal level some rudimentary norms were developing regarding the air space above the territory even the international conferences started to uh, come in towards the end of the 19th century some of the conferences have been convened but none of them have been much successful about bringing a separate law governing the aviation 1903 engine powered flights started and once the engine powered flights started it was very clear to the international community that the air space has to be properly regulated otherwise there will be lot of problems and this resulted in again multiple conferences before the first world war and even after the first world war after the first world war we got the paris uh, convention in 1919 itself primarily on regulating the aviation sector so the fundamental norms were codified in the form of paris convention 1919 soon after the first world war one of the fundamental issues which were there before which was there before the international community at that time was the debate between the freedom and sovereignty should there be a freedom in out of uh, in air space or should the air space be subject to the sovereignty of the state which is below that what has to be made applicable that was one of the major debate uh, when actually the international aviation law was developing united states and also certain set of scholars argued for the freedom of the air space in other words any country can fly uh, the aircraft in any corner of the world wherever they would like to fly they should be able to fly us was basically supporting because it wanted to commercialize as much as possible and get as many airways as possible in different uh, the country so therefore they were advocating for the freedom but the freedom was found to be problematic of course the freedom a theory was based on the grossius theory in law of the sea where in grossius basically advocated for the freedom of the seas in his famous book mare librum he basically argued that the sea should be free for everyone's use that should not be any sovereignty but grossius theory has not been accepted over the period of time in the law of the sea it has been actually rejected and we know that the certain parts of the sea are subject to the state at present so in the air space also uh, the sovereignty theory has been advocated as against the freedom especially because of the reason that if at all there is complete freedom to fly over any territory there might be some security threat which may be posed to the concerned state a foreign aircraft flying over the territory the country might not be knowing what kind of an activity the aircraft will be involved in it might be bombing the territory it might be causing certain damage to the concerned state so therefore 
the complete freedom theory has been rejected with respect to the application to the airspace. But then, full sovereignty or an absolute sovereignty over the airspace was also really problematic. If at all it is an absolute sovereignty without any limitation, the states might not be allowing other states, especially those states with whom they don't have a good relationship, right? They might not allow their aircrafts to fly over their territory, which means the different parts of the world might not be contact, connected properly, especially because the airspace may be blocked by the concerned state. So that's why an absolute sovereignty was also really problematic. And consequent to all these problems, what the international community has accepted for application to the airspace has been the principle of sovereignty subject to the right of innocent passage. It is a sovereignty, of course, the states are having the sovereignty over the airspace. You can find in the constitution, the definition of the state would also include the uh, air, uh, airspace above the territory. But at the same point of time, international treaties have respected the freedom in terms of the right of innocent passage for other countries. Now, the laws which have been developed over the period of time regarding the aviation sector have also been on this particular line. Primarily, we have the municipal laws because the sovereignty of the state applies to the airspace above the territory. So the states do have their laws applicable to the airspace. But at the same point of time, in order to protect the freedom of other countries in the airspace, there is a requirement of international norms which can ensure the rights of other countries. So that's how the development of laws have taken place with the mixture of both municipal law as well as international law with respect to the aviation sector. This is the background with which the development has taken place in the aviation. Moving forward, if I have to outline the international norms which govern the aviation sector, I should start with the Chicago Convention of 1944. The Chicago Convention is all the fundamental aspects if you look into articles 1 to 42 all of them deal with actually the sources of international air law it basically provides a different kind of provisions which will be governing the uh, aviation sector like we have the provisions regarding the uh, scheduled aircraft, non-scheduled aircraft, how should they actually carry on the uh, activities. We have the provisions regarding the registration of the aircraft, licensing of the personnel, documents, the various documents which need to be carried in the aircraft in every flight, right? All these different aspects are mentioned between Article 1 to 42 of the Chicago Convention. So therefore, the fundamentals of the international aviation law is provided by the Chicago Convention. Chicago Convention also has created an international organization in the second part. If you look into the second part, it creates the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. So this has been created under the Chicago Convention, which acts as the nodal agency in the international level, which is the major agency regarding all the aviation activities. Over the period of time, ICAO has been very much successful in terms of eliminating different kind of economic discrimination in the aviation sector. Of course, uh, it is also a dispute, it has a dispute settlement mechanism as well. If you look into the Chicago Convention, ICAO Council basically functions as a dispute settlement body under the Chicago Convention. But it has not been very successful as a dispute settlement body, but it has been successful in terms of eliminating the economic discrimination in different countries regarding the aviation sector. Apart from these provisions, what is more crucial is the updating of the Chicago Convention norm through the annexes. The Chicago Convention says that there should be annexes which need to be adopted time and again wherever there is a requirement of supplementing the provision of the Chicago Convention. It only provides the fundamental principles and then the remaining uh, developments, whatever have taken place over the period of time, in order to cater to them, the annexes can be added and we can find that there are 19 annexes which have been developed over the period of time in the field of the civil aviation under the Chicago Convention. We have the annexes like 
annex on licensing of the aviation personnel how the flying personnels need to conduct themselves regarding that we have the annexes aeronautical maps and charts we have the annex we have the annex regarding the airport how to maintain the airport what are the essential things which should be there in the airport with respect to all of them we can find that there are separate annexes which have been uh, entered under the chicago convention and these are always kept up to date whatever uh, new requirements are there they have been incorporated in these annexes that's how the chicago Con convention forms as the foundation of international civil aviation going forward soon after the first world war when the civil aviation started one of the primary questions which has developed uh, at a global level who should be liable to pay the compensation if at all any damage has been caused to the passenger or to the consigners or the consignees in case of the transportation of cargo who should be held liable and what should be the norms which should be applicable for fixation of the liability all these things were the crucial questions which cropped up after the beginning of the civil aviation which has been initially settled with the help of the warsaw convention 1929 the warsaw convention 1929 was the first instrument with respect to the carrier's liability and in fact this is the oldest international multinational convention which is still existing at present with respect to the civil aviation right so this is the oldest convention with respect to the civil aviation which is still existing at present now when the warsaw convention was adopted they fixed the liability on the carrier but while fixing the liability on the carrier the drafters were very very careful and they have ensured that the carriers are not overburdened in fact if you look into the warsaw convention it has got two parts the first part article 1 to article 16 they deal primarily with the different documents of carriage like the requirement of the passenger ticket or the baggage uh, uh, check that is the uh, with respect to the checked in baggage whatever receipt is given and then even the airway bill in case of actually the transportation the goods provided with the airway bill with respect to all of them you can find the provisions between article 1 to article 16 of the uh, warsaw convention 17 onward we can find the provisions on the fixation of liability on the carrier 17 speaks about liability for the injury or the death of the passenger 18 is on the liability for damage caused to the cargo or to the checked in baggage and 19 speaks about the liability for damage caused to the caused by delay any damage whatever has been caused by the delay with respect to that the liability has been fixed under article 19 however the liability norms under the warsaw conventions were not strong it is more in favor of the carriers if you look there were a lot of defenses which have been provided if you look into article 20 and article 21 both of them provide a kind of a blanket defense to the carrier to exonerate themselves from the liability and over and above that article 22 of the warsaw convention also provided a ceiling of the liability that is the maximum liability of the carrier the carrier would not be liable beyond that level right so the fourth there is a ceiling which has also been provided under article 22 and it is very very uh, low level of ceiling so it's a very very lower level so consequently the warsaw convention has been more favoring the uh, the carriers as against the passengers who might have been injured out of the civil aviation accident now as the time passed on of course uh, why why is this so let me just uh, tell that before going on to the further development this is primarily because number one there has been a strong lobbying by the carriers in the negotiation in 1920s and more importantly number two the reason was that the carriers at that particular point of time were not strong like the present scenario they were all initially investing for the civil aviation they were all not sound enough to pay the huge amount of compensation so consequently the higher level of liability if it is fixed on the carriers at that time nobody would have invested in the civil aviation people would not have invested in the civil aviation so precisely because of uh, this reason the warsaw convention is more oriented towards protecting the carriers interest in terms of liability rather than the consumers or the passengers but as the time passed on the carriers have started to become stronger and stronger they started to make huge amount of profit they became actually 
big multinational uh, entity. So at that particular point of time, it was found that there is a requirement of a shift from the carrier oriented regime to the consumer oriented regime. It was found by the international community that the Warsaw Convention limits are very, very low. Carrier's liability is actually at a very, very low pedestal. So therefore, a higher liability has to be imposed on the, the carriers. That's what the understanding of the international community once the carriers started to become a big multinational company. Consequent to that, amendments started to the Warsaw Convention. In 1955, Hague Protocol was entered, which basically increased the limit of liability and also it has taken away certain defenses of the carrier. Article 20 defenses, there has been actually changes made therein. Certain kind of defenses were cut down under the uh, Hague Protocol of 1955. Then in 1975, four Montreal protocols were entered, which have also increased the liability of the carrier. There has been a higher level of increase of the carrier's liability in the 1975 Montreal Protocol. But unfortunately, one of the problems with the, all these uh, convention and protocols was that some of the states who had become parties to the Warsaw Convention did not become party to the Hague Protocol. But some of them who have become also party to the Hague Protocol did not become party to the Montreal Protocol. So the consequence was that we had a bifurcated regime. In some countries, only the Warsaw Convention is applicable. Some countries, Warsaw Convention as, as amended by the Hague Protocol was applicable. In some other countries, Warsaw as amended by Hague Protocol, as amended by Montreal Protocol, maybe one, two, or all one, two, three, four, whatever it may be. So it was dependent on the ratification by the state. And consequently, we had a bifurcated regime applicable across the globe regarding the carrier slide. In order to sort out this issue and to have a single instrument, the, there was negotiation in 1990s and ultimately in 1999, Montreal Convention 1999 was entered. A separate convention, the Montreal Convention 1999 was entered, which was for the purpose of uh, harmonizing all these treaties into a single convention and also to bring in the new norms of the liability. For harmonization as well as development, for that purpose, the 1999 Montreal Convention was entered into. If you look into the Montreal Convention, it brings in a very, very high pretty consumer oriented regime, and you can even find no fault liability under the Montreal Convention 1999. Even if the carrier was not at fault, still he is liable. It's a kind of a strict liability which has been brought in in the uh, Montreal Convention 1999. And in addition to that, what the 1999 convention did was to cut down the requirements about the documentation. Earlier, if you look into the Warsaw Convention, there were higher level of requirements regarding the passenger ticket, baggage check, airway bill, and all those things. Now, those have been reduced down. But in terms of liability, stricter norms of the liability has been brought in under the Monty Convention 1999. So that's how the changes have taken place regarding the carrier's liability. But unfortunately, the intended goal of having single convention was not achieved, especially because of the reason that all the states who were parties to the Warsaw Convention or its amendments did not become party to the Monty Convention. Had that been the case, uh, we would have got only single instrument applicable for the carrier's liability at present. But unfortunately, the bifurcated regime continues to exist with all uh, Warsaw Convention, its amendments in the form of a protocol, or Montreal Protocol, and finally the Montreal Convention of 1999. So this is all about the overview of the carrier's liability. Next, another important aspect in the aviation is the product liability. Probably most of you must have heard uh, recently, a couple of years back, there has been two major aviation disasters. Both involved Boeing uh, 737 MAX, right? Boeing 737 MAX, I think you must have heard it in the, uh, in the TV or the newspaper, wherever it may be, you must have heard about it. Uh, it is primarily because the Boeing has not properly tested its new technology. It went ahead with actually the old design and made certain uh, modifications and it did not test it properly. And consequently, uh, 737 MAX 
uh, there were two major uh, disasters resulting in the death of more than 300 people one in uh, ethiopia and other one in indonesia so both of them have resulted in uh, heavy casualties subsequent to that uh, there has been actually the uh, ban on uh, the boeing corporations the 737 max it has been all of them have been grounded for almost one and a half years ultimately only uh, very recently last year actually uh, the united states once again gave permission for the 737 max after actually all the uh, changes whatever has been done by the boeing corporation the boeing corporation now has to pay a compensation to the extent of 2.5 billion dollars 2.5 billion dollars that's what the accident if there is a death maybe on board the aircraft or maybe outside the aircraft on the ground or wherever it may be what shall be the liability of the producer of the aircraft that is something very crucial and also it becomes very significant to understand is it actually the negligence of the carrier or the operator which has caused the damage or is it that the negligence of the producer in the beginning itself when he has produced the aircraft which has resulted in the accident so depending on that the carrier's liability or the product liability issue would step in in the aviation sector but on the product liability we don't have any international convention it is all dealt under the municipal laws so we know that actually the in the municipal law the product liability regime is different in different jurisdictions some of the jurisdictions go for the strict liability but on the contrary some jurisdictions go for actually the negligence based liability in case of the product liability so given that factor in the aviation sector leaving the product liability to the municipal laws of the different countries is something really problematic and the scholars are pondering upon that is there a possibility of international norms to be developed in terms of product liability in the aviation sector right so that's primarily about the product liability uh, in the aviation apart from this there is also actually another concept which is called as the uh, crashworthiness the concept of crashworthy crashworthiness so uh, which basically says that uh, in a circumstance of any kind of an accident the aircraft should be built in such a way that the aircraft itself is not going to cause any kind of injury to the people who are inside that it should be built in such a stronger way that the aircraft body itself should not be causing any kind of a damage to the people inside that's what is the concept of crashworthiness but again that is debated how do you how do you find out the crashworthiness of an aircraft right so you can't actually test it for all permutation and combinations it's not possible to actually find out what kind of accident might occur in the aviation sector and consequently Uh, how much of the crashworthiness should be there in the aircraft is a debatable uh, issue whatever it may be the product liability ultimately banks on the municipal law we don't have international norms on it so uh, there is a search for having international norms being developed on that aspect of the product liability in the civil aviation next aspect is the liability for surface damage <clears throat> i have already discussed about the carrier's liability under the warsaw convention and its amendment and the montreal convention but please keep in mind friend all these norms are applicable only with respect to any kind of a injury or damage caused to the parties to the contract that is in case of actually the passenger flight between the passenger and the carrier if the uh, passenger gets some kind of an injury then the warsaw convention and the related instruments would be applicable or alternatively in case of the transportation of the goods the consigners and the consignees could be contracting with the carrier so if there is any damage caused to either to the consigner or consignee then the warsaw convention and the related instrument would be applicable but in a circumstance wherein the aircraft falls over the territory and causes damage to the third parties on the surface of the earth then the warsaw system or its amendment or the montreal convention they are not applicable they are not applicable so that for there was a separate set of the norm which have been tried to be developed in the international level initially in 1932 in the form of the rome convention they basically developed a norm for the surface damage but then uh, subsequently it has been amended 
1952, we have a new convention, the Rome Convention 1952, which also has got a protocol, the Montreal Protocol of 1978. There is a Montreal Protocol of 1978, which is supplemental to the 1952 Rome uh, Convention. If we look into the Rome Convention or the Montreal Protocol on the surface damage, they speak about the liability of the operator. It is the operator of the aircraft who shall be liable to pay the compensation. Of course, operator in many circumstances may be the carrier, but need not be in all circumstances. So there are differences. We have the definition of the operator in the convention itself. Sometimes carrier might not be the operator. The owner of the aircraft might become the operator of the aircraft, and he will be liable to pay the compensation. So liability is different, and plus another important thing is that since the beginning, Rome Convention has got gone for actually the strict liability for any kind of surface damage. Article one of the Rome Convention clearly says that if the aircraft falls over anyone's territory and causes damage therein, the operator will be strictly liable to pay the compensation without any kind of an exception. So that is how actually the uh, uh, liability for the surface damage is something different. Or liability for the third parties is something different when you compare that with that with that of actually the liability for the parties to the contract. Rome Convention and the Montreal Protocol they deal with it, but unfortunately both of them are not having adequate ratifications. They have ratified it. Remaining countries they go by their municipal norm with respect to the surface damage. Right? It has a limited applicability. We don't have the universal application of the Rome Convention. And the model protocol of 1978. Next, aviation insurance, another very very significant area. <clears throat> there are three different kinds of the insurance in the aviation sector. They are aviation hull insurance, carrier's liability insurance, flying personal insurance. Hull insurance, it is nothing but the aircraft insurance, the body of the aircraft. The owner of the aircraft insuring the aircraft per se. That is nothing but the hull insurance. Carrier's liability insurance may be of twofold. On the one hand, it may be for the liability towards the parties to the contract, arise under the Warsaw Convention or the Montreal Convention. On the other hand, the liability which may arise against the third parties, like the surface damage, which I have just discussed in the previous slide. So, with respect to both of them. The carriers may take the liability insurance. The carriers may go for the liability insurance. The third type of the liability is the flying personal insurance. That is, with respect to those people who are flying in the aircraft and who are the employees of the concerned carrier, like the pilot, co-pilot, or air hostess, or any other staff who are the flying personnel. So, with respect to them also, the insurance coverage can be taken. By the concerned owner of the aircraft. So these are the three different kind of the insurance which are there in the aviation sector. Unfortunately, aviation insurance is not free from problems. There are multiple problems, especially in terms of the risk in the aviation insurance. All of us uh, would be knowing that investments in the aviation sector is huge, and also after the 9/11 incident. We don't know how much of the catastrophic damage might be caused out of an aviation accident. Suppose if an aircraft falls over a densely populated area, that would be say on the on the one hand destruction of the aircraft. Next, the passengers in inside the aircraft would all die. Plus, there might also be damage caused on the surface of the earth. Huge scale damage, like nine nine eleven incident, where many insurance companies became bankrupt out of the the nine nine eleven accident. So. Uh, precisely uh, because of that reason, there is a lot of problem with the aviation uh, insurance sector. Uh, the premiums were going up, especially when the risk was actually increasing. Uh, if you look into the status soon after the 9/11, many insurance companies they become bankrupt out of that incident. Plus, apart from that, many other insurance companies withdrew from the market. They simply said that we will not give aviation insurance, even though. They have not paid any amount of compensation. Uh, the effect of the deterrence was such that all of them said that no more aviation insurance. And even those companies who continued with the aviation insurance sector, they stopped 
not that you charge because insurance is ultimately on the basis of the risk and return factor what they will try to actually uh, have more premium they will try to get more return out of actually those kind of risks so precisely because of that reason aviation insurance has been fluctuating over the period of the, the time it was not very much stable the concerns are very much there uh, in this sector next <clears throat> another very significant aspect is the civil aviation crime until 1960s find much development in terms of the civil aviation crime even though the crimes were on starting from 1940 when the first hijacking took place so there were many different sort of the crimes which have been committed but one of the major problems regarding the civil aviation crime was to exercise the jurisdiction and to apply any law for dealing with the civil aviation crime interestingly probably the the people of the current not be knowing if you go back maybe uh, some say 3 years or 80 years back we can find that there was a rigid extra territorial uh, rigid norm against the extra territorial application of the criminal law of course nowadays we have liberalized to a greater extent we are trying to exercise the jurisdiction on some count so extra territorial application are tried to be done in different terms. if you look into the earlier practice extra territorial application of the criminal law was completely prohibited it was so rigid that in the common law countries the states were not even exercising their criminal jurisdiction over the air space above the territory despite the fact that there is sovereignty available in the air space the the rigidity of the norm against the extra territorial application was such that the common law countries were reluctant to apply their criminal jurisdiction even above the air space over their territory so which was really problematic even the civil law countries also to a very very limited extent that is only to the extent of nationality if the offender is their national or if the victim is their national then only they were applying actually their criminal law to any crime committed in the air space otherwise they were not ready to apply their criminal law thinking that it might uh, result in extra territorial application of the criminal law. so that is the very reason why uh, there has been a lot of problem because uh, people would commit a crime in the uh, aircraft or maybe uh, in the airspace and ultimately they will fled to one of these countries which would not accept the jurisdiction and they would be caught free no action would be taken against them so precisely because of uh, this reason the civil aviation crimes has started to pose greater uh, problem at the international level developments regarding the international norms to deal the civil aviation crimes started in 1960s and 1970 we had three major conventions during this time 1963 tokyo convention came into existence which basically conferred certain powers to the commander of the aircraft that is the chief pilot so he has been conferred with certain powers to deal with the crime uh, on board the aircraft he has a right to confine the person who is who has committed the crime or who is about to commit the crime he has a right to deboard the passenger so he can land in the next territory and then he may actually uh, ask the passenger to actually uh, deboard the, the flight or even he can hand over the person to the competent authorities of the concerned state for the purpose of the prosecution and investigation so all these powers were given to the commander under the tokyo convention and the respective state wherever the person has been handed over they have been mandated to go for the investigation and if necessary prosecution so that's how the tokyo convention set the tone for the purpose of uh, exercising the jurisdiction as well as applying the law for dealing with the civil aviation crime but the tokyo convention was found to be insufficient especially with respect to the crimes like hijacking in the municipal level most of the states did not have a separate law governing hijacking that means in case of hijacking they used to try those uh, try offense uh, offense of hijacking under other norms maybe like say unlawful con confinement unlawful taking uh, the control of the particular object and confining the people or in, ca in case any kind of a 
free has been caused to the passenger in the process of hijacking so hurt or previous hurt all these kind of the provisions were invoked for the purpose of dealing with the serious offense like hijacking and the punishment used to be very very less by virtue of this so ultimately the international community started making effort in terms of having a separate convention that this resulted in the 1970 Hague convention a separate convention the Hague convention was entered where then actually the uh, punishing or prosecuting the offense like hijacking has been brought in even the principle of ought detre or judicare that means either you prosecute or you extradite extradite the offender that has been brought in in the Hague convention and consequently the uh, serious offense like the hijacking has been dealt uh, with the serious punishment then in 1971 one more important convention convention was entered into that was the montreal convention 1971 this is with respect to any sort of a crime which may be threatening the safety in the civil aviation tokyo convention mentioned only about the crime inside the aircraft the convention mentioned about a serious crime like uh, the hijacking that too only uh, inside the aircraft it did not mention about actually uh, uh, threats from the ground and uh, asking the pilot to actually uh, take the aircraft to some place uh, or maybe doing any other kind of an activity from the ground that has not been covered under the hijacking uh, sorry under the Hague convention so ultimately the montreal convention 1971 was brought in to cover all these kind of crimes even if a person on the ground threatens the uh, the pilot and asks him to land somewhere or the person on the ground uh, uh, fires the missile and destroys the aircraft all these kind of things are covered within the ambit of the Monty Convention 1971 as the offensive. So these three conventions give the base for dealing with the civil aviation crime. And then subsequently, in uh, 2010 and 2014, amendments have been done to these conventions. 2010, Beijing Convention and Beijing Protocol have been entered into. Beijing Convention was for the purpose of substituting the Montreal Convention 1971. A new convention was brought in in the form of the Beijing Convention uh, 2010. Then the Beijing Protocol was for the purpose of amending the Hague Convention 1970. Regarding the hijacking, with respect to that, the new uh, protocol came into existence, the Beijing Protocol, which basically amends it. That's how actually the changes have uh, been introduced uh, uh, in the Hague Convention and the Montreal Convention has been replaced with the Beijing Convention of uh, 2010. If you look into these two instruments, what they have primarily done is to expand the scope of offenses. Offense like 9-11, that has not been actually covered under the Hague Convention, not been covered under the Montreal Convention in a proper way. Or offenses like using the BCN weapons, biological or nuclear weapons, or carrying the biological or nuclear weapons without the permission, all these kind of things were basically not covered under the Hague Convention or Montreal Convention. They have all been brought within the ambit of the uh, Beijing Convention and the Protocol. Finally, in 2014, even the Tokyo Convention has been amended in the form of Montreal Protocol 2014. The Montreal Protocol 2014, which amends the Tokyo Convention and also brings a stronger norm, uh, even with respect to the normal crimes on board the, the aircraft, it also speaks about the possibility of having uh, having a, a person, a, uh, maybe the a police person, who may be actually uh, helpful in terms of uh, reducing the crimes on board the aircraft, just like in the railways, also having somebody on board the aircraft. All these things have been actually brought in under the uh, 2014 protocol. That is how actually uh, uh, amendments have been done to the norms governing the civil aviation crimes. And currently, the stronger regime are brought in for the purpose of dealing with the civil aviation Moving forward, the next aspect is the aircraft financing and leasing. This is one of the most significant aspects wherein a lot of practices are happening. Of course, many people might not be knowing, especially because the big companies like the Boeing, Airbus, they're all in the western part of the world, plus also the major airlines. You can also find it in actually the other countries. Uh, Indian airlines, most of them are in crisis. But whatever it may be, even in India, it is relevant. Uh, aircraft financing and leasing 
has got a lot of issues. On the financing, one of the major problems is that for the aviation industry, as we know, the huge amount of financing is required. It may be in few billion dollars. The investments will be in few billion dollars. Whenever such a huge investment is there, the investors or the owners of the those industries, whatsoever it may be, they will not be able to have the finances from one single country. They have to get the finances from different countries. Finances will be from different countries. Ultimately, if this uh, owner of the industry fails to pay back the money to these all these finances in different countries, how exactly these finances are supposed to enforce their rights against this particular debtor? How should they enforce their right? If you look in the international level, there is no international financing law. We don't have any international financing law. So it's all municipal in nature. So given that factor, one of the major problems is that how a foreign creditor can enforce his or her right in uh, another country, wherever the debtor is residing. And again, another important aspect is that there may be hundreds of financiers from different countries to one single industry. Whenever there is a failure from the debtor to pay back the money to the creditors, maybe all the creditors, first question which crops up in terms of the interest is that who should be having the priority in getting back the money? Rule of priority. Who should be first getting back the money? And then the sequence, what should be the sequence of getting back the money? That is very, very crucial. And unfortunately, in the absence of international treaty, there is no uniform rule of priority. And if you go back to the municipal law, each of the municipal law would be having their own rule of priority. Some of them may go for first come, first served basis. Whoever is the first financer would get back the money first, second, third, fourth, fifth, like that. Some jurisdictions may make a distinction between the secured creditors and unsecured creditors. Secured creditors would get first, unsecured would get later. Some other jurisdictions might have some other mechanism, like say, for example, whoever has financed more would get back the money first, then the next one, like that, or maybe the reverse of that. So all these are the different norms of the priority which are applicable in different jurisdictions, which would all create a lot of confusion. Creditors would not be very clear as to whether they are going to get back the money or not. Same is the case with the leasing. Even in leasing also, the owners would be having a lot of problems in terms of enforcing their rights to get back their money from the lessee, right? So precisely because of that reason, there will be a lot of issues which would be arising in the municipal level. In the absence of an international treaty, unit UNIDRUA, UNIDROIT, right? So this is actually a, the body for the unification of the private law, UNIDRUA. It has started looking into the unification of the finance laws especially with respect to mobile equipment. It does not mean our mobile, right? So it means those which move from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, but which move from one country to another country. In that, they have primarily focused on three kinds of mobile equipment. One among them is the aircraft equipment. One among them is the aircraft equipment. So they have another two, that is the railway rolling stock, and the other one is the space asset. So with respect to them all, also actually they are having the, the norm which has been developed over the period of time. On, on this, what UNITRUA has done is that it has got a base convention in the form of the Cape Town Convention, one single convention which would be codifying all the general norms about these mobile equipment. And then apart from that, there are also area specific protocols which would be governing the specific area like the aircraft equipment, railway rolling stock and the space asset. There are separate protocols also governing these areas. And we have to read the base convention along with the area of specific protocol for the purpose of understanding the financing law applicable to each of these areas. So for aircraft financing, we have to read the uh, Cape Town convention, that's the base convention. And we should also read the aircraft protocol along with the Cape Town convention for the purpose of understanding the financing law. And this system provides the kind of a security and predictability to the uh, investors, especially because it provides its own mechanism for the enforcement of the rights of the creditor. It has its own mechanism 
it provides its own remedies it has its own rule of priority who would be getting back the money first who would be getting next all those things are mentioned in this system therefore the unitruva system now takes care of aviation financing as well as the leasing notes right and a lot of practices are happening in this uh, particular field so if anyone is interested you can go further in detail with respect to this of course it's a very very complicated system not that easy but at the same point of time there is lot of scope for practice uh, in the field of aircraft financing as well as the, the leasing now the last aspect which i would like to tell you is about the aviation law in india i have discussed about the international development finally let me just briefly touch upon the aviation laws in, in india of course we had a lot of developments in the aviation sector maybe we should also thank the britishers to a certain extent with respect to this because during that time a lot of aircrafts came to uh, india despite the fact that in many countries there was not even a single aircraft in india there were many aircraft at that time itself but soon after the independence one of the major issues which started to arise was with respect to the unhealthy competition between the different private airlines the different private airlines were actually coming into the picture and there was a unhealthy competition which was developing amongst themselves which was leading to a lot of concern at the same point of time there was a, there was also problem in terms of the airport administrations connectivity and all because the karachi airport uh, during the partition went to pakistan and our western gateway uh, was not available so karachi was the major western gateway for the india which was also not available after the uh, the independence so there were a lot of problems happened soon after the independence uh there afterwards the committee was established by government of india to look into that with the matter and upon the recommendation of the committee and subsequently also the administrative decision making at the governmental level they came up with the enactment the air corporation act of 1953 for nationalizing the airlines government of india went ahead with the nationalization and it created only two airlines air india and indian airlines air india international with respect to the international uh, carriage and indian airlines with respect to the domestic carriage and for a period of almost four decade entirely the aviation sector was the government monopoly it was completely regulated by the government until 1994 when the air corporation act, act has been repealed so once the air corporation act has been repealed once again the private players have started to reemerge and they had got a lot of uh, the private players uh, coming in and going going as well so many of them have also become bankrupt so i should say that the indian aviation industry is not free from concern there is a lot of crisis and especially during this covid 19 uh, many of the uh, airlines have suffered actually huge losses huge losses so uh, i don't think actually any of the airlines have made profit uh, I, i mean we know that actually the kingfisher was grounded uh, jet airways was also Uh, spicejet was about to be uh, grounded and air india suffering huge loss and currently actually there is a uh, there is a move for the privatization so all these things are happening so therefore the, there is lot of concerns in the aviation sector uh, in india as for the laws are concerned we have the aircraft act and the aircraft rules which basically provides us the primary norms governing the aviation it includes the norms of registration licensing most of the other things whatever has been mentioned in the chicago convention they can all be found in the aircraft act as well as the aircraft rules on the aspect of carrier's liability the warsaw convention or its amendment montreal convention with respect to that we have the carriage by air act 1972 as amended in 2009 carriage by air act 1972 as amended in 2009 and in fact uh, the indian carriage by air act has got three different uh, schedule <coughs> there are three different schedule especially because india has been a party to the warsaw convention then the hague protocol 1955 and it is also party to the montreal convention 1999 so all the three norms are uh, implemented in schedule 1 schedule 2 and schedule 3 respectively so three schedules are there in the respective next on the aviation crimes we have also implemented actually all those international conventions earlier the tokyo convention hague convention and montreal convention we have implemented and subsequently the changes made in the 
uh, Beijing Convention and Beijing Protocol. They have also been implemented, and we are we are having the Anti Hijacking Act. There has been actually changes which have been also made in the Anti Hijacking Act to make it uh, much more stronger than the earlier legislation. So civil aviation crimes have also been actually dealt under the separate legislation in India. Finally, uh, we also have the application of Consumer Protection Act for dealing with the uh, aviation, uh, any kind of a deficiency of service in the civil aviation. Consumer Protection Act has been made applicable. And if you look, many of the cases with the deficiency of services may be filed by the passenger or maybe more importantly, filed by the consigners and the consignees have gone to the consumer fora. They've all gone to the consumer fora and uh, probably the aviation cases have not become very popular. Many people might not be knowing much about the aviation cases, especially because of the, the, the reason that many of them don't go to the ordinary court of law, rather they would go to the consumer redressal court. So precisely because of if anyone is interested about the number of cases or about different kind of cases, whatever has happened in India in the aviation sector, one can go to the decisions of different consumer court. So this is all. Uh, which I would like to say about the aviation uh, law. It's just a brief overview. In fact, actually, uh, uh, I told earlier itself that aviation law and space law need, uh, should not be studied together. They should be studied separately. In NUJS also, I offer them uh, separately. Uh, the, one of the reasons is that both aviation law and space law have developed so much that we can imagine. This is just an overview. And this, I mean, I, I take at least actually 80 hours to cover this entire aspect, uh, if at all, actually, I'm teaching uh, in my university. So precisely because of that reason, I should say that there's been tremendous development which has taken place over the period of time in the field of aviation. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. If, you, if there is any question, I would be happy to answer yeah. those questions. Uh... Mr. Bhatt, you actually, we were just feeling that we are in a flight mode and we are enjoying the flight. You took us to the entire gamut of insurance law, finance and leasing, then how the conventions are there and if aircraft finance and leasing. And as you rightly said, this is a, and what we also said at the outset, that this is a topic which normally a lot of law students also and universities also do not know about the space law and aviation law. There's very less litigation, but yes, it's uh, different. So before we take a question, uh, what are the career opportunities at this aviation law as such? Because a lot of people would actually like to know. Right, right. Yeah, unfortunately, in India, aviation and space law, the people are not very much aware of the career opportunities. But uh, aviation law practice has started in India also. Right, Even though the space law practice is quite limited, uh, aviation law practice has started uh, in India also. There are a lot of cases. Uh, as I told, actually, it has come up with the before the consumer fora. You, ca you can't find them before the ordinary, I mean, before the ordinary court of law. So, therefore, people who are practicing in the consumer fora would be able to tell you uh, much about actually what kind of cases are coming up. But uh, if I have to tell you, primarily the cases which come up are about the liability, the carrier's liability, the, uh, the, in terms of the transportation of baggage or maybe in terms of the transportation of the goods, any damage, whatever has been caused in the transportation. For that, a lot of cases are coming up. Uh, but apart from that, aviation accidents, like the Mangalore aircraft, uh, air crash case, 2010, right, the Mangalore air crash, so which has resulted in actually the lot of debate. Uh, currently, the case is also before the Supreme Court, how much of the compensation has to be paid, all these things are uh, debated. And uh, in all probability, actually, the, the maximum amount of compensation would be uh, received by the lawyers, not by actually any of the victims. So that much of actually the amount is involved in the aviation sector. And apart from that, another important aspect which I told already is about the aviation financing. Uh, uh, um, and uh, if you look abroad, uh, there are certain firms which are practicing exclusively in the field of aviation, aviation law. And they are making multi-million dollars, right? So every year they are making multi-million dollars. So, Therefore, uh, there is no uh, scarcity of opportunity if at all actually one expert, uh, one, one is expertizing in the aviation, uh, the law. A lot of opportunities are available. So that's what I can tell about the opportunity. In the aviation. This is by uh, advocate uh, Murli Dharan. He says Indian international flight, place of accident is in India, mostly Indian passengers from abroad. 
how to calculate compensation and which convention will apply this uh indian international uh, it's an indian international flight and the place of accident is in india right uh, and, and passengers are also mostly uh, from uh, abroad okay so indian which country is, yes which country they belong is very important because at the end of the day it is on the basis of the fact that which common minimum convention is applicable if the passengers are from a country which has not ratified the montreal convention right so in india what is applicable is montreal convention had it been a situation where in actually uh, it's a domestic flight the montreal convention as per the notification would be applicable but if it is a international flight where in actually the passengers are from abroad then we have to find out what exactly is the law applicable to that particular passengers country is it the uh, montreal convention is it the hague protocol or is it the warsaw convention for the common minimum convention that law would be applicable and uh, one question now we all discuss as students of law and otherwise also about the conventions what is the sanctity and the value in the legal terms if one actually wants to understand these conventions so see uh, as far as the conventions are concerned in the international level we have the principle of pacta and servanda that means actually we have to respect our uh, international treaties in good faith and even article 253 of the indian constitution specifically speaks about that so we have to actually abide by the international treaty obligation but more significantly in case of this liability which actually i mean the question has primarily arisen with respect to the carrier's liability we have already implemented these liability norms under the carrier by air act we have schedule 1 schedule 2 and schedule 3 so one is about the warsaw convention two is about the hague protocol and uh, three is about the montreal convention so depending on actually to which country the passenger belongs and whether it has ratified the montreal convention or not if it is if it has ratified the montreal convention montreal convention Uh, norms should be applicable, and we have to calculate the compensation accordingly. Or else, it should be the Hague Protocol or the Warsaw Convention, Schedule Two or Schedule One, respectively. I hope you have. I have answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, these Zoom etc. have uh, their own challenges. Sometimes you yourself get muted. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I will just check it out on the Facebook as to whether we have any questions. Sure. We actually took all this uh, session so that people can get get it. No, we don't have. So, okay. uh, th thank you, Mr. Bhatt. It was uh, a session. Me also, it was an eye opener, like you said at the outset. Normally, when as a lawyer, also we say that there are a lot of challenges and a lot of career opportunities in a space law and aviation law. normally you feel that they are to be read together and the way you took us to the entire journey of this it was a, a a good journey to be enjoyed and it was an insightful session and i'm quite sure that people will enjoy it and so friends tomorrow do stay connected with us to have the second part not second part as such but the today we have on the aviation law tomorrow it will be on the space law and i'm quite sure that Uh, though there was no space left uh, in the in respect of the aviation law but we will understand the space law tomorrow which is a different topic as mr bhat uh, has advised at the outset so everyone stay safe stay blessed jahan and mr bhat thank you for giving the insightful session thank you thank you so much thank you